We light this cam candle in memory of Wiley Dobbs, who is uh, one of our friends and church members who is serving time in a Georgia prison. We light this cam candle in remembrance of Kim and Stan and all of our Cuban friends and all the many struggles that they are going through now. We light this candle to remember all who are affected by violence. And we light this candle in remembrance of all those who have died from COVID-19 and who are affected by this virus. And this candle we light to remember all in our circle. May the light of Christ be with us all. to our circle of mercy gathered for worship. We are grateful that you can join us this day. Join our band and mark our videographer and we are missing Missy today, but she's taking some vacation time with some of her friends out in Seattle. I am delighted to welcome as part of the worship team for today, my granddaughter Sydney and my daughter Jessica. Friends, how blessed we are to have a community of faith who are living witnesses to Christ's truth and justice. What a grace to be on this particular journey at this particular time with you curiously strong people. May this service steward the impossible possibility that holy and divine truth and grace can still rise up within us, 
Turn us around. Turn this world around for God's good intent and hope for us and all of creation. So Sydney, will you offer our opening prayer that comes to us from the poet Denise Levertov. As swimmers dare to lie face to the sky and water bears them, as hawks rest upon air and air sustains them, so would we learn to attain a free fall and float into creator spirit's deep embrace, knowing no effort earns that all surrounding grace. Welcome, my friends, to our Circle of Mercy Circle Story. I want you to shut your eyes for just a moment. And imagine that we're all here together in a big circle. 
Can you see us? Okay, come on. Get a good spot now. I am really in need of having some friends today, so you might want to move in a little bit closer, could you? Yes. You see, there are times in which I've had some really bad days, hard days. Have you had those, those kind of days? It makes me remember the story, Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. You had those kind of days? Well, Alexander had so many of those kind of days that he decided he'd move to Australia. I've had some of those times that I want to move to Australia too. Just last week. Why, I was up trying to get a stink bug off the ceiling. And do you know, the ceiling fan caught me and I didn't catch the stink bug. And it ripped some of my skin right off. Oh, terrible. And then, you know my little dog, Gracie? You're not going to believe this, but she ate a little rubber stopper, the kind, you know, that go on big balls and balloons and stuff like that, a little rubber stopper. She swallowed it, and she gagged and gagged and gagged, and I couldn't get it out, and, and I turned her upside down and shook her, and it still didn't come out, and then I tried to do the Heimlich method, and she still didn't get it out, and she gagged and gagged. She threw up, and it didn't throw that up. Oh! It was a terrible day. She got better, finally. Thank goodness. Oh, but then this day we kept going on with many terrible things. So, Sydney and Jonathan were gone to the beach, and so I said, oh, well, I'll take care of the chickens while you're gone. So when it got dark, you know what you do when you have chickens? Oh. You are a chicken. So I guess you know that what we do is that we try to keep you safe. So we come to your chicken coop when it gets dark and they put you in there and make sure that you're safe and locked in and no other little critters can come and hurt you. It's a pretty good idea. But every night, you got to count how many of you are there are. So I went into the chicken coop and I counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh oh, there's supposed to be 11. Where are the other two? Maybe I counted wrong. I counted again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, still, what happened to those other two? Oh no, did I lose two chickens? So I went out into the yard. I looked all over the yard. I went into the bushes. I, looked, I couldn't find them in the bushes. I looked up in the tree. There was no chickens in the tree. I went in the garden. Were there chickens? No, I couldn't find these two chickens. What was I gonna do? I decided I should move to Australia. What, you have something to tell me? Oh, really? They lose chickens in Australia too? Well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna move to New Zealand instead. That's what I'm gonna do. So I wandered about and then I got so mad at myself and I just sat down in the grass and I was looking all over and I was thinking, why can't I even take care of chickens? I need to be doing some really important things not just looking for chickens. It's a mess of a time out there in the world and I need to be some, do something really, really good and I'm just looking for chickens that I can't find. And then I looked up at the sky. The stars were so bright and they covered the sky. And then I saw this moon I don't know if I've ever seen a moon so big and so bright. And it beamed down all around the yard. It beamed on all of us and I felt like oh, it's beaming into me too. And I thought of this prayer that's right in the middle of the Psalms. 
that says, Where can I go from your spirit, O oh God? Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. And then I thought, you know, God loves me. And God loves the chickens. And I remembered that psalm about God being like a mama hen. And so I prayed, Mama God, cover us all with your feathers and gather us safely under your wings for safety. And I sat there a really long time, hoping and praying that God would gather everyone under her wings, everyone who was lost or afraid, and keep us all safe and at peace. And then as I left the yard, I yelled into the chicken coop, and I said, I've decided not to move to Australia. You know, those prayers, they made me feel like God is watching over me and all of you. The next morning, I went to the chicken coop to let all the hens out so they could be in the yard. And do you know what? There were two chickens running around that chicken yard that morning. So, 11 chickens! They were all there. It was a terrific, wonderful, and very good day. And I remembered the psalm. I give you thanks, O oh God for your steadfast love endures forever. Thank you, God. Peace to you all. Let's stay under God's wings. Amen. Hear now the ancient testimony as it comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said, You've heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We struggle, we grow weary, we despair, we hope, we give up, we get ready, we rise up, we fall down, we wait, we hurry, we get a clue, we have a no clue, we are numb, we are jittery, we forget, we remember, we are angry, we are kind, we are afraid, we are brave. And if you're like me, that's all happening before breakfast. Thoughts and feelings are jumbling and tumbling through our bodies and spirits throughout the day and into the night. We are in personal and communal trauma time in this country and in our world, and surely in our own being. Muting the attack ads and turning away from the latest reckless action of leaders, it's not enough. We are connected to all other beings, and anxiety is in the air we breathe. Words fail us until they don't. Sometimes words can be a bridge over troubled waters. Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount gives a name to one of the hardest bridges that we are called to walk across as people of faith. Love your enemies. His troublesome words really could be dismissed as naive and impractical, except he spoke them to traumatized people, powerless people, 
who were facing the daily injustices of the regime of the enemy of the Roman Empire. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How do we pray for those who persecute us? Words fail us until they don't. So one possibility for words comes from the psalm. We can find psalms for strength and comfort, for presence, all beautiful. But what do we do if we are experiencing anger? It is so problematic for us peacemakers to know what to do with our anger. But there are words for that, prayers that can give us voice to what is deepest in us. So perhaps the first prayer for our enemies is a prayer of vengeance. My particular favorite is Psalm 109, but you may have your own. The prayer, like all the psalm prayers, it's personal. It is always spoken in the first person. Psalm 109 is the prayer of a person knowing the depths of injustice. It's a prayer of, of truth and honesty from a people who have never been given a voice or a consideration. People who know that the system has been rigged to keep them suffering. It's a prayer of a battered woman or the mother of a son murdered because of the color of his skin. It's a prayer of a family who's just been evicted from their home. It's a prayer of the parents who are seeking to cross the border, whose children are snatched away from them. It's the prayer of a person who lost their job. It's a prayer of a person who can't afford health care, or the person from the LGBT community who is cruelly treated by the abuse of religion. This is the prayer of people forced to live with the endless blows of power arrangements that dismiss cries for justice and mercy. So the language of this prayer, it is raw. It is completely unfiltered. It is direct. It is saying, you God, I'm talking to you. The prayer doesn't hold back and it doesn't cushion the fury. So fasten your seat belts, my friends. We're going in. Be not silent, O God of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They beset me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me even while I make prayer for them. They reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. God, where are you? Can't you see what's going on? Appoint a wicked judge over him and let an accuser stand right there and testify. And when he is tried, may he be found guilty and may his prayer be counted as sin. And God, if you need some ideas about what to do, let me give you a few. May his days be few. May another seize his position. May his children be orphans and his wife a widow. May his children wander about and beg. May they be driven out of the ruins they inhabit. May the creditor seize all he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his, of his toil. You know, it's really hard to find the right tone when you're praying a vengeance psalm. And it's very problematic for angry words, especially to be spoken in public by a woman. Nevertheless, she persisted. May there be no one to extend kindness to him, nor anyone to pity, pity his orphan children. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before God. And do not let the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before God continually. And may his memory be cut off from the earth, for he did not extend, remember to show kindness, but pursued the poor and needy and the brokenhearted to their death. It's not really kind, is it? Not very balanced. He loved to curse. 
let curses come to him. He did not like blessing, let it be far from him. He clothed himself with cursing like a coat. He let it, may it soak into his body like water, like oil into his bones. May it be like a garment that wraps around himself, like a belt that he wears every day. These words of vengeance are not being acted on. They are words, they are, are they offered to the enemy? No, not at all. This is a prayer to God who can take it, who can hear these cries. Okay, but then here it comes. The turn, the turn around. Oh God, act on my behalf for your name's sake. God, your reputation is on the line here. So could you step up your efforts and hear these cries? Because of your steadfast love, deliver me for I am poor and needy, and my heart is pierced within me. God, I am brokenhearted. I am one of the heartbroken. All this anger, God, I know I can't live in it. It's killing me. And it's not doing a thing to my enemy. I'm gone like a shadow in evening. I'm shaken off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting. My body has become gaunt. I've become an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they just shake their heads. I can't eat, I can't sleep. This is making me sick, body and soul. Help me, O oh God. Save me according to your steadfast love. And let them know that this is your hand, O oh God that saves me. Help me, O oh God. Save me according to your steadfast love. Let them curse. I know they will, but you will bless. Anger is like a fever. It can cleanse us of the toxins in our system, but we can't live in a fevered state. We will die. And when we have a fever of body and soul, it helps to have a few people around us to help care for us, to help us get through it. Trusted folk who can accompany us. A small, small trusted listening in friendships. And we don't want to infect others with it. Anger is a contagion and it can be part of the healing and revelation of what's happening. Unchecked, it can burn our house down as well as ignite fires that we didn't intend to start. But anger can be a gift. It can point to the pain it boldly marks where we hurt and what injustices we know. And it is an honest answer, an honest prayer to the horrors that are happening. But the psalmist knows the enemy is not going to be the one to save God. If I am healed, it will have to come from you. May my assailants be put to shame. May your servant be glad. With my mouth, I will give you great thanks and I will praise you in the midst of the throng. For God stands at the right hand of the needy to save those who would be condemned to death. When Jesus said, love your enemies, we remember that he spent his short life resisting the enemies of the most vulnerable people. 
and resisting the abusive powers of that Roman Empire. When he called us to love our enemies, it was a call to power, to rise up knowing who we are, not becoming like the enemy, but tapping into the power they know not of. The people who've been the most maligned and rejected, who know this inner power, they are the ones who are rising up to lead us on this way knowing the divine center that holds, we can be full of hope, rising up together with the power of God's revolutionary love, a power that cannot be shaken. We are free to act, to love with a love that will never let us go. For we are convinced that what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love.
Greetings, friends. In my work as a body worker and movement educator, so much of my curiosity is pulled to how our physiology is intimately connected with our psyche, our emotions, and our spirits. Our cellular tissue can carry the memories of trauma from generations past, or the anxiety of challenges that we anticipate might come. It can also remember our sensations connected to elation, support, and wonderment. Our cells carry our heartaches, our worries, our fears, our anger, and our sense of belonging, our compassion, our delights and pleasures, our peace and ease. Our cells have a wide capacity to protect, to bolster, to release, to honor, to understand, love, and connect. Simply by becoming aware of their tone, we remind the body of the varied choices that it has. It can tonify and strengthen and mobilize and create solidity on one end, and on the other end, it has the ability to yield and soften, to release, to liberate, to disperse, and all of the possibilities in between. I believe that for a healthy and vital and resilient system, we want to have the most options and capacity available to us to mix and match and toggle between any of these tones. We need the ability to stand up for ourselves, to be clear and strong, to mobilize, and we also need the ability to rest, to be quiet, to soften and listen. The trouble, though, comes when we get stuck in one of these options without being tethered or aware of our other options. And when this happens, we diminish our potentiality. We limit our capacity. We become fragmented. We forget our inherent ability to embody the fullness of who God created us to be. There's a saying in the body work community that the issues are in the tissues. In my work with clients, I work with the tissues of the body to remind the system of its potentiality, to remind the parts and pieces of ourselves that we are a connected whole to remind the trillions of cells that are in support of each other and they can be in relationship with ease. Simply stated, I work with the body to keep energy, emotions, fluids, and thoughts moving, connected, and known. I so believe that so much of our chronic pain and discord in our physical bodies are rooted in our body's limited capacity to allow an emotion to be fully sensed, recognized, named, moved through, expressed, or metabolized. And sometimes this is for really good reason, because things can be too much sometimes. And our bodies have the amazing brilliance to hold on to the emotion and store it for later for when it's fully able to process the expansiveness or the layered complexity of that emotion. Anger has been one of our big emotional themes lately, in my own body for sure, and in our global body. We are seeing more and more ways in which this anger is unleashed and discharged in destructive, and horrifying ways. It is untethered. It is fragmented. It has simmered for too long and has nowhere else to go but out in an explosive kind of way. This kind of anger is not in relationship to the whole. This kind of anger has been building unconsciously in the tissues 
of the body for a long while and feels it has only one way out. On the flip side though, anger also has the ability to mobilize us, to take action. Anger is the turbo jet fuel that can mobilize us to do feats we never thought possible. We might finally write our political leaders, form a committee, create new and innovative ideas, or rise up to engage in causes that we are passionate about. When we're paying attention and can utilize our support, we metabolize this kind of anger to channel into causes, ideas, inventions that support the whole. So yes, these two examples are polar opposite to highlight the extremes. And I don't know about you, but in these current times, my energy is waning. And I don't have a lot of support within me to mobilize my anger in ways that require bigger action. However, the anger is still building. I still feel it simmering in the background. And there are many days when it's just easier to ignore it, to numb it out, and to not fully feel it. Those options can be the occasional necessary medicine, but I want to remain awake enough to recognize that the buildup of the anger in my system cannot continue to permeate and dominate my capacity to love. The energy of anger in my physiology must be metabolized. I hope that you have your unique ways in which you safely metabolize the energy of anger in your own system. But today I wanted to share a few favorites of mine. One huge way to metabolize anger is big movement with the whole body. Long strides of walking, shifting your arms from side to side, or marching with conviction, or maybe it's dancing in your living room or your front yard, taking up lots of space. Any movement that takes energy from your center and sends it out into the periphery through your hands and your feet and your head and your pelvis, that's the kind of movement I'm talking about. A quick fix for moving anger in the body is to shake. <sighs> if the aversion to shaking brings up some discomfort in your system, the anger may have a strong hold on your cells, but that's okay. You can start small with just your hands, and it's a practice. So at, go at your own pace and start small and notice if the shaking can get bigger over time. Another option is to exaggerate the physical sensation of anger in your own body, which really allows the body to sense and recognize in the foreground what it may be feeling unconsciously in the background. For me, anger feels like a retraction of my limbs into my torso. It feels like my blood pumps with a stronger rhythm through my heart and my belly. So I exaggerate that. I meet my body with what it really wants and needs to feel. I allow that anger to bubble up and become known and felt and heard from a physical space. And in doing this, the process of metabolizing that anger happens. And on the other side of it, I feel spacious, wider, and more capable of listening with an open heart. I feel like more of me is available to meet the world and I continue to practice embodying my wholeness. We want to bring into our circle today and continue to remember Jasmine's mother, Paula, who's in her journey with cancer. 
And we also would like to remember Tyrone as he continues to recover from surgery. Please pray with me. Oh God, we have come to you exactly as we are. We are fragmented and we are whole. We are tired and we are energized. We are diminished in our capacity and we have capacity that is unfathomable. We are angry and we are loving. We are scared and we are daring. We are forgetful and we have never forgotten. We are ravenous and we are satiated. Remind us, O oh God, that the diversity of our sensations and emotions illuminate your spirit moving through us. Remind us to pay attention. Remind us to leave space for your expansive and limitless love to seep into ourselves and radiate that love into our world. Give us the courage to trust the wisdom of our bodies. Thank you for the gift of our bodies to live out the call to love. Amen. Our call to the, the table today comes to us words, from words by Albert Camus. In the midst of hate, I found there was within me an invincible love. In the midst of tears, I found there was within me an invincible smile. In the midst of chaos, I found there was within me an invincible calm. I realized through it all that in the midst of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer. And that makes me happy. And it says, for it says that no matter how hard the world pushes against me, within me there is something stronger, something better, pushing right back. The body of Christ broken for you. This is the cup of hope poured out for you. Friends, this is a table where we know something stronger, something better, something pushing right back that gives us the invincible, calm, centered love. Christ invites us to receive this. Come and know this gift.
Friends, we're so glad that you could be joining us this day for our worship service. We're grateful for Mark and Brian and our musicians. And I'm very especially grateful for Sydney and Jessica joining us as our team today. And BJ with her flowers, don't forget to carry this uh, picture with you all week. So friends, knowing that the divine center holds, rise up, keep on loving, and know that the peace of Christ goes with you all. Amen.